Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, some of our conference reminders and welcome uh, to make sure that Sophia has her full length of time for her keynote. Um, so hello and welcome. I know that people will to continue to come in. Um, and as you do so, just please introduce yourself in the chat. So welcome to the 2021 ALAO conference. Uh, so excited to see everyone here, see digitally. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jess Crossfield McIntosh, and I'm the 2122 president of ALAO. And I'm so excited to welcome all roughly 60 people at this point, um, but 280 of our registrants this year for our annual conference. Also, welcoming our. Sorry, I'm getting some transcript on. There we go. Thank you. And um, welcoming you all here along with our conference planning committee who have been so wonderful this year, to our second fully virtual annual conference. <laughs> so as we get started, um, as I mentioned, we have more people coming in. Uh, just go ahead and please introduce yourself in the chat. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of the various lands on which we work today, including the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We pay our respects to indigenous leaders past, present, and emerging, and we recognize and celebrate the diversity of indigenous peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land on which we live. I encourage all to learn more about the native people and their own communities who have continued to steward these lands throughout generations. So talking a little bit about our theme, uh, last year we talked a lot about resilience as colleagues, members of institutions of higher education, and as individuals. The last two and a half years have uh, pushed us uh, beyond what many of us thought we could survive. As myself and the CPC were brainstorming ideas about the conference for this year, we really wanted to think about where we could be based on where we've been. As we build new connections and create new conversations, we really need to think about what's important to change and evolve after what we've all collectively experienced. To continue to push the dialogue and explore how we can grow our institutions into truly inclusive places. This takes more than a conversation, uh, but really takes action. And I hope this conference can bring you closer to discovering these action-driven steps for your libraries. I'm so excited to learn from all of you, and I hope this conference brings you ideas, strength, friendship, and most importantly, helpful dialogue as we find ways to connect and improve things for each other and our communities. So again, welcome to this year's conference, Building Bridges, Dialogue, Deliberation, and Connection. So before we dive into our keynote speaker, I have a few reminders that are conference related. Each year for the ALO conference, we host a service project to collect resources for a charitable organization. This year, we are partnering with Free Press, an organization that promotes equitable access to trustworthy, trustworthy news and information. Free Press advocacy areas include media and platform accountability, net neutrality, and affordable high-speed internet access, and diversification of media ownership. We ask that you consider making a financial donation to this worthy organization. If you go to our homepage on the website, you will find links to access free press. I also want to highly encourage you to attend our award ceremony today during the lunch break to celebrate those in our organization who will be recognized. I hope you will be there to cheer on our colleagues who are awarded for providing excellent service to ALAO. And hopefully everybody had a chance to watch the orientation video orientation video as it explained how the conference sessions will be viewed. But as a quick reminder on how to attend a session, after the keynote is over, you will go to whichever session you plan on attending. And there you can watch the pre-recorded video live with the presenter and other attendees while asking questions in the chat. At the end of the recording, the presenter will respond to questions and or have time for discussion. If you need help at any point, please email program at aleoweb.org or tweet hashtag 2021 ALAO and someone will get back to you. Along those lines, please keep respect and kindness at the forefront as we go through our discussions today. If you're experiencing anything negative from anyone else, please let a member of the CPC know. 
So I'd also like to say thank you to all of our sponsors whose generous support has helped to keep our registration costs so low, which is really important for all of us during these pandemic times. So if you have a chance, go to our homepage and check out all of the conference sponsors. And if you know any of these folks, please say thank you. So some of our sponsors were uh, so generous that we offered to show a short video, and I'm going to bring that up now. So give me one second as I make sure the sound is pumped up. Hello, my name is Katherine Mannion and I'm your new sales representative from Cambridge University Press. I'm so pleased to have this opportunity to introduce myself to the Academic Librarians of Ohio and I can't wait to work with all of you in the years to come. If you'd be interested in setting up a virtual meeting with me, please get in touch with my email address below. Thanks so much for your attention and have a great conference. Cambridge Core is the online home of academic books and journals published by Cambridge University Press. It brings together over 34,000 books and over 370 journals across 37 subject areas. Built specifically to satisfy the needs of millions of researchers worldwide, Cambridge Core provides fast, intuitive journeys to content, whether via in-platform searches, library systems, or search engines. Cambridge Core also provides services for authors, librarians, and publishing partners. Introducing Higher Education from Cambridge University Press, our new home for textbooks. Created specifically for the students, instructors and institutions of today, the Higher Education website offers the highest quality content and resources, from leading authors to instructors and students. Built on the same platform as Cambridge Core, it has been designed to combine the convenience of institutional access to textbooks with improved functionality and new interactive features to support students' online learning. For librarians, we prioritise the unified experience with Cambridge Core, making hundreds of textbooks across science, technology, nursing, humanities and the social sciences available. We offer flexible purchasing options with no arbitrary limits or controls on the usage of those books across your institution. Visit www.cambridge.org forward slash higher education to find out more. Thanks again to our sponsors. And now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. I'm looking so forward to this as I am a big fan of Sophia's work. Sophia Learn is a first generation Chinese American librarian, facilitator, educator, and the principal of Do Better, Be Better. Her work employs critical race theory and emergent strategy principles, and her focus is on building community among Black, Indigenous, and people of color and libraries and beyond. Sophia is a founding editor at Uproot, a We Here publication, and a facilitator for the Association of College and Research Libraries Information Literacy Immersion Program. She is co-editor of Knowledge Justice, Disrupting Library and Information Studies through Critical Race Theory, and she holds a Master's in Library and Information Science and a Master's in Public Administration, both from the University of Washington in Seattle. And her BA is in English from Barnard College. Sophia will be sharing today what is at work in our library work. And welcome, Sophia. I'm handing it over to you. Thanks, Jess. I'm just going to share my screen. And also, I just want to make a note that since I'm since we're recording, I have my camera off just for privacy reasons. Um, OK. Let's get started. So hi, everyone. Um, I hope that you and yours are doing well. 
and staying as healthy as can be in these chaotic times. I just wanna thank you for joining me and taking time out of your day to listen to my talk. And a big thank you to Jess for inviting me to speak. And also thank you to the conference planning committee. I appreciate the enormous amount of effort and labor that went into putting something together on this scale. Okay, well, as just said, I'm Sophia, my pronouns are she and hers, and I'm just sharing at the beginning um, some places you can find me because I won't be doing that at the end. Um, and if you do want to tweet this out, you're welcome to. I'll just give you a moment. You need any of this information? Okay. So I'm just going to start with a short meditation to help ground us in this virtual space and time. So whenever you're ready, if you want to plant your feet firmly on the floor, you can either close your eyes or lower your gaze when you're ready. And just take a deep breath in and let it out slowly. Let go of the moment before and settle into this moment. Maybe you visualize yourself pulling energy up from the earth beneath you. And if it's helpful, you can see it as a glowing light. Feel that light or energy spreading up your legs into your pelvis, up the front of your torso, up your back. Start to feel it go down your shoulders, your arms, your neck, and your face. Maybe that lighter energy is now traveling up behind your eyes and up through the top of your head. Take one more deep cleansing breath and let it out slowly. And whenever you're ready, open your eyes. So I'd like to share some gratitude for those who came before me, who showed me that it was important and necessary for me to take up space and who refused to be limited by what others imagined for them so that I could do the same. And I'd like to honor the indigenous peoples who cared for the land that I am on today. I'm on the unceded ancestral territory of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag peoples, which is still home to many Native American people, including the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. I also want to acknowledge the free people forcibly kidnapped from Africa in order to be enslaved on these lands, and that this nation state known as the United States was built on the erasure, exploitation, and oppression of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And as a Chinese American settler, it's important for me to acknowledge this history of violence, disease, and genocide that led to the colonization of this land and my eventual inhabitants of it. Um, and just for myself, I'm trying to, you know, be better about reflecting on what it means to be a settler and guest on these lands. So I'd like to ask you to do the same for the lands that your settlers on and how you might behave. So this slide is just meant to be a guide, um, not the first or last time that hopefully you'll ever see anything like this, um, but just meant to be like a starting point um, or a continuing point. So some questions to consider, whose land am I on? What names the native peoples of these lands wish us to use? What is my responsibility as a settler or guest on these lands? What actions can I take in solidarity? What land is my library on? And what is my institution's relationship to the peoples whose lands we are on? What is our responsibility to them? So for me personally, one small way that I'm trying to move towards land reparations is by making a monthly contribution to the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. And I encourage you to do the same depending on whose lands you have settled on. And then these are just some resources that I have found to be helpful, but I encourage you to do your own research as well. 
And I also want to call your attention to the recent violence against the Haitian asylum seekers trying to find better lives for themselves by coming to this nation state. While our government continues to enact colonial violence against Black people by treating them like cattle at the border and deporting them back to Haiti, which is still a physically unsafe and um, politically unstable from a huge earthquake and political unrest. And, you know, I just want to pause and say that every time I give a talk or um, facilitate a workshop, it's really enraging and depressing how often I have to add in whatever new like, hellish thing our country or our government or our people are doing that connects back to white supremacy, racism, and settler colonialism, and that these things are all connected. So in case you couldn't already tell, we'll be dealing with some heavy topics today like racism, white supremacy, and how we're complicit in those systems. So some difficult feelings and discomfort might arise, and I just want you to be aware of that before we get started. One of the reasons that I like to begin my talks with a meditation is to connect our minds and bodies, because when we talk about difficult topics, it's important to be aware of how that shows up in your body. So your jaw may tighten, your shoulders may rise to your ears, your stomach may be in turmoil. So I just ask you to pay attention to your body so that you notice when those things happen. And when you feel yourself tightening up, you know, just take one or two slow deep breaths and try to release that tension. It actually will help. <laughs> okay, so because of this format, I know attendees can add their questions in at any time. So I just wanted to provide some guidelines on that before I got started. Um, so at the end of my talk, I'm going to be using progressive stacking, which is a process that I learned from OZ Elysium, where I'll prioritize questions from BIPOC and answer those before I answer questions from white folks. So in the Q&A, please self-identify as Black, Indigenous, or person of color by adding an asterisk at either the beginning or the end of your question. And then second, I'm borrowing Dr. Eve Tuck's approach to Q&A to prevent violent questions which means that I'm asking you as the audience to peer review your own questions. So before adding a question to the queue, please ask yourself, is it really a question? Does it need to be asked and answered in front of everyone? And is your question asking me to do the work that really you, the question asker, should do? Okay, so I know that people already introduced themselves at the beginning but I just wanted to add on one extra thing to that. So if you could share in the chat your name, your pronouns, and one word that describes how you're feeling today. I like to get a, a little temperature check on the room and also get a sip of water at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely feel the sleepy and tired people because I'm not a morning person. <laughs> so I'm trying to bring my energy up for this talk. But thank you to those of you who are excited, um, feeling ready, overwhelmed. Yeah, definitely lots of overwhelming things happening. Taking some deep breaths, lots of excitement. Oh no, somebody's sick and in pain. Oh. Horrible. Okay, well, take care of yourself. Um, obviously, it's nice and cozy at home, so hopefully you're not stressing out too much while at this conference. Yeah, that's okay if you have more, to put more feelings. Great, yeah, keep putting those in. Um, I will continue on, but definitely feel free to add in um, if you haven't yet into the chat. Okay, so I'd like to share this great quote from Alicia Garza, who's one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And in her recent book, The Purpose of Power, she writes, before we can know where we're going, we need to know where we are, who we are, where we came from, and what we care most about in the here and now. And I really like this quote because it establishes a process for how we move forward in any project that requires transformative change, particularly through an anti-racist and anti-oppressive lens. 
And the way that we, you know, quote unquote, solve a problem is often dictated by how we frame that problem. So the problem that I'm interested in addressing is the instances of harm that we cause in our everyday work by not understanding and or recognizing how systems of oppression are intertwined with our everyday work. And a quick note before I get too much further in, but I wanted to briefly share that when I use the acronym BIPOC, um, I mean Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, and the term is meant to quote, highlight the unique relationship to whiteness that Indigenous and Black or African-American people have and which shapes the experiences of and relationship to white supremacy for all people of color within a US context. And I use it as a term of solidarity among people of color, while also understanding that it's still a highly contested term, uh, especially among people of color. So to borrow Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's words, native peoples were colonized and deposed of their territories as distinct peoples, hundreds of nations, not as a racial or ethnic group. So I wanna be careful when and how I use this acronym and not just use it as a blanket term when what I really mean to say is that this thing I'm talking about specifically refers to a particular group of people um, and that to do so is to continue to perpetuate white supremacy ideals of simplification and conflation rather than pushing for complexity and nuance. Okay. So earlier this year, I read the introduction to Toward What Justice, Describing Diverse Dreams of Justice and Education by Drs. Eve Tuck and Kay Wing Yang, where they address a set of questions to better address, uh, to better understand projects or interventions that are working towards social justice. And the questions that they ask are, what is at work in all of this work? What does this work care about? What animates and compels this work? What does this work believe about itself and others? And when I read those questions, I realized, oh, these are the questions that I've been trying to get to over the last six or so years to understand what libraries are trying to do, what library workers, and I include librarians in this grouping, think that we're working towards, what we're hoping to accomplish, and what common goals we think we're working towards. And it makes me think about the culture and politics of what our libraries do and have done. More specifically, how have our libraries treated communities of color and how do they continue to treat them and how do, how do they continue to think about them? All right, so I wanna return to these questions from Dr. Tuck and Dr. Yang throughout my talk. Okay, so let me just back up a bit and tell you a little bit more about myself. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, but I've lived all over this US nation state. I'm the daughter and granddaughter of immigrants. I'm Chinese American. I'm heterosexual, cisgendered and able-bodied. And I have plenty of class privilege which enabled me to attend graduate school when I wanted to. I was an academic librarian for a while. And although I no longer work at an institution, my employment still relies on institutions. And all of these elements have influenced my talk in some way and are important to the lens through which I wrote this talk. Just as all of you will hear and interpret this talk through the specific lens through which you move through the world. You know, and I believed and I still believe in the power and promise of libraries. But you know, I also thought that working in libraries was about social justice. It's why I became a librarian and it continues to drive the work that I do now. However, library and information science as a field and a profession has not delivered on a lot of what it has promised us. Claims that I'm sure many of you have heard before, such as leveling the playing field, the educational playing field, providing access to information for all, upholding democracy, and protecting intellectual freedom. But this promise has not been fulfilled for all of us in this country. Um, not now known as America, right? That this is not a mistake or an accidental oversight. This is purposeful and intentional. We all have our own motivations for working in libraries, which we may think drives our work. And many of us also believe that our work in libraries serves the public good. And therefore that we as people who work in libraries by extension are also quote unquote good. Bobazi Itar coined the term vocational awe to describe this idea that, quote, libraries are, institu 
libraries as institutions are inherently good and sacred and therefore beyond critique. And of course, you may have guessed that I'm just about to do just that. Um, and here's the thing about critique, right? A lot of us immediately feel discomfort and fear when we even hear, you know, just that word critique. We see it as someone trying to challenge us in a negative way, someone trying to resist our perspective or someone, you know, just trying to be difficult. But this is a product of white supremacy culture. And because I've been doing this long enough um, that I know some of your ears, you know, just went up when I said white supremacy, I'll remind you to take a deep breath. And, you know, I'm gonna do it too. And I wanna pause here and let you ask yourself, you know, why did I tense up when I heard white supremacy? And also wanna give you a second if you wanna write down your thought process if that will help you at all. No, but just so that there are no misunderstandings about what I mean when I say white supremacy, I wanna share this definition from legal scholar, Francis Lee Ansley, who wrote, by white supremacy, I do not mean to allude only to the self-conscious racism of white supremacist hate groups. I refer instead to a political, economic and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources Conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. So white supremacy is an ideology that dominates social, cultural, and economic systems. It creates hierarchies and disenfranchises those who fall outside that ideological spectrum. So, you know, those who aren't considered quote unquote white um, or you know, black indigenous and people of color or also those who don't perform whiteness in socially acceptable ways. So for example, disabled folks, queer and trans folks, religious minorities, um, et cetera. And white supremacy isn't good for anyone, right? Including white people. This is an ideology and it's something that's at the very core of our systems and services, but not something something that we often openly name or think about because it's a system of control within which we all live and have been indoctrinated into. It uses the social construct of whiteness and racism as its main tools of domination. So let's consider how white supremacy is at work in libraries. I wanna use the example of the Tuvalu Nine to break down Ansley's definition of white supremacy. The Tuvalu Nine were a group of black students who were barred from using both the main library at Tuvalu College and the Jackson Public Library because of segregationist policies. So here we see, quote, a cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources by barring these students from using material resources, you know, i.e. library spaces and collections. And then Ansley continues, conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread because you know, black folks were considered inferior to white folks and therefore white people felt entitled to exclude the Tougaloo Nine and all black people from both libraries. And then finally, the last piece of this definition, relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted. So the Jackson Public Library workers called the police on the Tougaloo Nine for having the nerve to sit down in their library. And this resulted in the, in the students being forcibly removed from the library, arrested and sent to jail. And also just wanna briefly say, right, that the Tougaloo Nine did this on purpose, that this was a form of resistance and also calling attention to the ways in which black folks were being treated in so-called public spaces. Also wanna highlight the fact that this happened in 1961, which is really not that long ago. And in fact, we're still very much deeply complicit with white supremacy ideology today. We don't have to look very far for similar instances of black, of black students being ejected from college libraries where they have every right to be. And the particular instance that really sticks with me and not just because 
It happened at my alma mater, Barnard College. It's from 2019, where Alexander McNabb, a black student, was violently restrained by campus security for trying to enter the library, you know, where he had every right to be. And so I want you to think about this and maybe ask, what is it that we're trying to protect in a library that's so precious we have to have security officers in place to enact violence on people just trying to go about their daily business? And then we have to ask, you know, also, what does this work care about? Right. And ostensibly, the American Library Association states that the core values of librarianship are access, confidentiality and privacy, democracy, diversity, education and lifelong learning, intellectual freedom, the public good, preservation, professionalism, service, social responsibility and sustainability. But the examples of the Two Blue Nine and Alexander McNabb, among others, makes it pretty clear that libraries have a very specific meaning in mind when they say they care about access, democracy, service, and the public good. As ALA states, a democracy presupposes an informed citizenry. The First Amendment mandates the right of all persons to free expression and the corollary right to receive the constitutionally protected expression of others. The publicly supported library provides free and equal access to information for all people of the community the library serves. So the library is supposed to provide free and equal access to information for all people. It's an educational resource. Public libraries are supposed to help keep the citizenry informed. And that's part of what we, including black people pay taxes for. But if libraries are keeping out black folks, then the logic here would say that libraries don't want black people to be informed. They don't want them to be a part of a democratic society. And as a fundamental institution in American society, li libraries are operating as a tool of the American government to help the white supremacy project of disenfranchisement. But, you know, we're just not saying it explicitly. And, you know, libraries have always been good at hiding behind their supposed neutrality by stating that they care about access for all and intellectual freedom while at the same time serving the interests of racial domination. And just to paraphrase Gary Peller's words, institutions claim to be neutral and objective, which allows them to exert a power over people. And in order to be seen as neutral and objective, LIS has to hide what it's doing, what it's erasing. White supremacy requires these conditions to thrive, to maintain its system of control. But, you know, also, I want to return to that question of what does this work believe about itself and others? And as Anastasia Chu, Fobazi Itar, and Jennifer Freddy write in their Knowledge, Just Knowledge Justice chapter, libraries are beloved institutions, both in practice and in the public imagination. Professional library literature extends this belief that the very existence of libraries creates democracy, learning and civilization, and it conflates librarians' work with the actual buildings themselves. And this belief in libraries and ourselves as library workers makes it really difficult to question the work that we do as institutions and individuals, which is exactly what Anastasia, Hobazi, and Jenny make clear in their chapter. And as someone who, you know, maybe naively got into this profession thinking we were all working towards social justice, I got a very rude awakening when I realized that wasn't the case at all, right? And in many cases, we were actually working against the process of social justice. Our libraries and archives sit on stolen land and the indigenous peoples of that land are usually erased from any historical or current understandings of that land. This means that our institutions and by extension, we as library and archive workers are participating in ongoing Southern colonialism or just not acknowledging it. And these erasures enable these institutions to hold tight to the idea that they're you know, still somehow good, that their mission as the American Library Association's website puts it of enhancing learning and ensuring access to information for all absolves them of any guilt. You know, and nor is it acknowledging that access is clearly not for all or that you know, to paraphrase my co-editor Jorge Lopez McKnight, that all knowledge is universal and should be shared equally among others. 
Dr. Sandy Grande writes that within settler societies, the university functions as an apparatus of colonialization, one that refracts the eliminative practices, modes of governance, and forms of knowledge production. And we are in a settler society, and libraries, not just academic ones, refract many of those same eliminative practices in the forms of knowledge production in the ways that libraries and librarians have decided what gets to be designated knowledge and what forms of knowledge production are acceptable, in the ways in which libraries take up physical and intellectual space with collections filled with the truths of white settlers while simultaneously participating in the erasure of indigenous knowledge, culture, and existence. And, you know, many of you may have heard all about that fuss from, and still ongoing, from Republican legislatures, uh, legislators across the country trying to ban critical race theory in K through 12 schools. And I'm bringing this up because I am a co-editor, um, you know, with Jorge Lopez McKnight of Knowledge Justice. And much of my work is um, using the lens of critical race theory or CRT. And then, you know, this, particular instance, CRT is being used as a dog whistle or coded language to get support from white folks without using overt calls for racist policy to be put in place. And the phrase critical race theory is purposely being used as a tool to drum up most racially motivated fear, as if by ignoring race and racism and our country's history, we'll somehow come together as a society. And most of the people against CRT don't even know what it is. Right, it comes out of legal theory as a theory and method to examine how race is shaped by the law and how that has concretely impacted the lives and experiences of black, indigenous and people of color and how to intervene in the legal system to stop the harm from happening. Pretty certain that none of us learned that in K through 12. And I doubt that any teachers are currently teaching this in their classrooms. You can see that it would be pretty hard to teach legal theory to kids in K through 12. And it's already fairly difficult for me, someone with two master's degrees, um, although neither of them has a law degree, to understand that the CRT legal articles, right? So I can't imagine that my baby nephew will be learning in kindergarten when he gets to that age, even if both of his parents are lawyers. And the other reason that I bring this up is because it matters to us in libraries and the information profession. This backlash is about controlling the narrative of this country this is a fight about who gets to tell the story of this country. And not to overly simplify our field, but you know, it is all about stories, right? Who gets to tell them, whose stories are worth saving, which stories we choose to uplift, and which ones we choose to erase. So I just wanna ask you to bear with me because this is a long quote, but it's from a podcast interview that Eve Ewing, a scholar, poet, and writer, did with Ezra Klein for his New York Times podcast. When I first encountered critical race theory, it was like a light opening up in the sky because it confirmed so many things that I always understood intuitively and that every person of color in the academy that I knew also understood, but that was so often not given language. And so some of my closest friends in academia, and I had a close friend who's Japanese American who went to graduate school with me and her entire family was interned during World War II. They were incarcerated. I think about it, I think about what it means to ask a person like that to prove that America has not always fundamentally been a good and just place. And that the legal system does not work equally for everybody. And for me, for classmates like that, to see it written by these esteemed, incredibly brilliant scholars, that the things our parents lived through, the things our grandparents lived through, the things that we lived through are a valid source of knowing. There are no words that I can give to how meaningful that was. The library is the American institution that houses the story of America. It's a story we tell ourselves and others about what this country is, what it's done, and why it deserves to be powerful. That is what animates and compels our work in libraries. Yakira Diaz, a Black Puerto Rican writer, wrote in her memoir, for months I'd spent every night lost in a book, read whatever the librarian put in my hands, 
which usually meant books written by white men about white people for white people. The librarians at the Miami Beach Public Library never ever recommended books about black and brown people, about queer girls from the projects, about people like me. I didn't even know those books existed. What does it mean when the stories of black and brown people aren't part of the story of the United States? I think we can say that we're living through what it means right now. And this is why Drs. Tuck and Yang's questions really speak to me. They make us ask ourselves the very questions that those with power don't want us to ask. They require us to get to the core of what it is our work is actually doing. White supremacy does not want us to question or critique our normal ways of doing business. It's an ideology that rewards doing things the way they've always been done. It makes us believe, as Tema Okun writes, that a good professional is someone who is perfectionistic and indi individualistic, insists their way is the right way because they are the expert, you know, or that being the expert is something that we should want to be, complies with and requires a certain kind of writing, defends against criticism, and thinks that to make a mistake is to be a mistake. All of those tendencies have led us to ignore, overlook, or deny the ways in which libraries and we as library workers are implicated and complicit in these larger systems of oppression. And when we don't question what's actually at work, we perpetrate and entrench the same intertwined systems of white supremacy, racism, settler colonialism, and capitalism that cause the very issues we claim to want to change. And here's the thing, right? The ideology of white supremacy has limited our imaginations so that we think only one way, the current way we have always done things, is the only way things can be done. And expanding our imagination starts with asking the kinds of questions that Drs. Tuck and Yang asked, and which I'm just gonna alter a bit to help open up some possibilities. What do we want to be at work in all of this work? What do we want this work to care about? What do we want to animate and compel this work? And what do we want this work to believe about itself and others? And I don't ask these questions because I have you know, the answers to them. I ask these questions because these need to be the questions that we ask ourselves individually and collectively all the time. I want the work of libraries to actually be working towards social justice. I want us to care about repairing the harm we've already caused and care about creating new ways of doing things that don't cause more harm particularly towards those communities that have been repeatedly harmed, um, you know, also historically over long periods of time. And I want our work to care about the liberation of black, indigenous and people of color. I want this work to be animated and compelled by intersectional social justice. I want this work to believe that it's not perfect and never will be, that it will make mistakes and that's okay as long as we're working towards the liberation of all people and not just select groups. In the same introduction for Toward What Justice, Drs. Tuck and Yang also write that in wayfinding, being a few degrees off and proceeding for a long time in the miscalculated direction can result in being miles and miles away from the intended destination. The small shifts at the outset are the stuff of inner angles. And what I interpret this to mean is, you know, what new movements, possibilities, and opportunities are opened up when we make these small shifts? What new directions can we move towards by just changing what may seem tiny? Another way to think about this is Adrienne Marie Brown's emergent strategy principle, small is good, small is all. The large is a reflection of the small. When the amount of change needed to transform these oppressive, system, these oppressive systems seems overwhelming, it's really helpful to be able to turn to this principle and recognize that transformative change often happens on a smaller scale first, and it can then spiral out into larger change. So one way to apply this idea is to a principle that I've turned to recently, which is we create an intentional space. 
the way I use it is as an engagement norm for my webinars and workshops. And what I usually say is something like, it's up to us to ensure that we do not cause harm to others. And white folks, I'd like to ask you to be more thoughtful before sharing any thoughts and feelings around some of the content I'm about to talk about, as you may unintentionally cause harm towards the people of color who are attending this workshop with you. I cannot control what you do, but you can. Remember and recognize that your feelings have always been centered. And I'd like you to think about the harm that's caused in the past. So this principle, we create an intentional space can be applied to nearly everything. For example, in a meeting, you know, you could say, what kind of meeting am I trying to run? How do I set the stage for that meeting? How do I ensure that the best outcome I can hope for um, through like some of the things I can set up ahead of time for this meeting? What kind of tone do I wanna set? And how can I create the kind of environment that would do that? And how could we apply this more broadly to a library space? What if we center those who have been historically excluded on purpose from our library spaces, collections, and staff? What if we paid attention to our historical, social, political context before we created, implemented, and enforced policy? What if we moved away from punitive forms of punishment for not following policies and practices? And what would it mean to be accountable to communities of color who have been historically excluded? To the white folks who wanna be in solidarity with liberatory projects, let me borrow the words of education scholar, David Stovall. You have agreed to support something that will challenge you in the support of it. And at some point you have to get out of the way of the people committed to doing that work. You have to ask yourself, is what I'm doing helpful or is it actually harming the very folks I'm trying to support? The work of racial and social justice is always already in motion. It's not waiting for you to get on board. We're just waiting for you to get out of the way. So to close, I just wanted to highlight some black indigenous and people of color founded and led organizations and projects around LIS that are separate from and independent of traditional LIS institutions. And these are spaces where liberatory work is being done and they are for and by black, indigenous and people of color. And these are the projects that you should be supporting and uplifting. And I'll just put them in the chat. And just read them out briefly. We hear uproot. Lib Voices, Librarians of Color, Los Angeles, WOC plus Lib, The Black of Us, Lost Capture, Black Excellence in LIS Syllabus, The Nomadic Archivist Project, uh, Project, The Black Music History Library. And then another list. Fix My Library Podcast, the International Indigenous Lib Librarians Forum, Project Stand, Black Librarians, the Free Black Women's Library, Ethnic Librarians and Staff, Hijabi Librarians, Libraries for All STL, and South Asian American Digital Archive. And of course, there's many more than this. Um, and I just wanna thank the We Here community for helping me to compile this list. And again, it's not the whole list, but just a starting point. I just wanna thank you again for your time and attention. And if you have the funds, I encourage you to donate to the Haitian Bridge Alliance, a nonprofit community organization that advocates for fair and humane in, uh, immigration policies and provides migrants and immigrants with humanitarian legal social services with a particular focus on black migrants, the Haitian community, women and girls, LGBTQ plus individuals, survivors of torture and other human rights abuses. And I'll put the link in the chat. Okay. So thank you again. And just a reminder of the guidelines for Q and A. Thank you. Can you all hear me?
Yay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Sophia. That was such a wonderful way for us to start our conference. Um, and I welcome anybody to enter questions into the chat. We have just about a minute or two um, before our short break and our next sessions at 10 a.m. Uh, and Sophia, thank you uh, really for sharing all of those resources. I think that those can be a really helpful way for us to start digging in more into these topics. Sure, thank you, Jess. Yeah, and uh, feel free to reach out to Sophia if you do have other questions and don't want to ask here. Um, I think that this is such an important conversation and I thank you so much for talk talking with us today. I don't see any questions coming through. <laughs> Lots of thank yous. <laughs> And I must say too, the meditation was so lovely. Um, I kind of think we should all start that with every day <laughs> with that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely need to we'll do it more often <laughs> myself. It's kind of thing that you don't, you don't do it enough and then you do it and you're like, I really need to do this more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you again, uh, everybody. We have about nine minutes before our 10 o'clock sessions. So please give a virtual round of applause again for Sophia, and I look forward to the rest of the day and hope you all have a great conference.